Hello lovely people, welcome to another book chat, the regular roundup of stuff I've read at some point in my past. Sophie Vlogs! I've got three books I want to talk about this week, and I thought I would start with one that I read on Libby. That is When Life Gives You Mangoes by Corrine Getton. This follows 12-year-old Clara, who lives on a Jamaican island, and um, she has some memory loss from the summer before. She can't remember anything that happened in this summer when this big hurricane hit the island, um, and this is the summer after that. Um, and it should be a normal summer, but she's having um, arguments with her best friend Gaynor, and then this new girl arrives on the island, and essentially, like, things develop from there. Um, one thing I really liked about this was this, like, um, small island life, like, everyone knows each other, and, like, I really felt, like, the sense of community with both its, like, positives and its negatives that come from, you know, like, from being so tight-knit, you have, um, a lot of, like, support and stuff like this, but equally, like, everyone knows each other's business and that sort of thing. So especially with this conflict that arises between Clara and Gaynor, like, it's not just something that's just between the two of them, like, the whole village is involved and that sort of thing. This was one of those books where when I first started reading it, um, I was having a perfectly enjoyable, lovely time, but as it was going on, I didn't quite understand, um, I felt like a lot of the reactions from, like, the village and the adults and stuff to stuff that was happening, specifically with, like, Clara's behaviour and stuff, I felt like it was a really, um, just a little bit extreme for what was happening, and I was a bit confused. I will say, without giving any spoilers, like, you do reach a certain point in the text when a piece of information is given to you, and it was very much like a key in a lock moment, where I suddenly understood, and I suddenly had context for all of these, like, small things, because I was enjoying it, and I was, um, you know, I, I felt rooted in Clara, and I, uh, felt rooted in, like, this village and their life and stuff like that, and Clara's obviously working through stuff and stuff like that, and I felt, like, immersed in that world, but I didn't feel like I, something didn't quite sit right with me, um, and then as soon as that piece of information was given, I suddenly understood, and I really liked that, I thought that that was done so well in a way that really, um, it takes its time and it doesn't rush it, but as soon as you understand the full picture, everyone's behaviours make sense, and then when you go forward from that point, it's like there's all this hindsight and you really understand like, oh, okay, this, what might have felt a little bit um, extreme and inauthentic, actually, I understand entirely now. And I thought that, that was done so well. Um, I also really liked the way that like this compassionate, like, um, you know, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that Clara's memory loss is very much the result of some stuff that happened the summer before, and I felt like the sort of, the different methods people use to try and help her, whether they are helpful or not, I understood the type of person and what they were offering, even if what they're offering is not actually what Clara needs, so I felt like that sort of like, um, showing you the different ways that people deal with stuff like that, um, I don't know, I really enjoyed it, and actually, like, by the end of this book, um, I read it in a day, <laughs> it was very easy to read, um, and I thought it was really well done, and I gave it four out of five stars, I thought it was good. Um, after that is Runelight by Joanne M. Harris, I read the, uh, first book in this series very recently, it should be a very recent book chat, I'll link it down below so you can hear my thoughts, I won't go into any spoilers here. So this is a series that is uh, very rooted in Norse mythology. The first book follows Maddie, she's growing up in this little village, she has a rune mark which shows, which is like a rune on her skin and it is sort of a source of power, but in this very superstitious time she's living in, there's this thing called the Order which is set up in World's End and they've sort of, um, they're essentially like the religious organisation that um, has power in this place, and they've um, convinced a lot of people that these rune marks are bad things, because these rune marks are connected to the old gods who um, is set after Ragnarok has fallen, um, and then Maddie sort of gets involved, she meets Loki, and essentially like shenanigans ensue, and like, you know, maybe they're going to bring the old gods back, that sort of thing. I gave the first book four out of five stars, I thought it was really good, it really built into something that I really enjoyed. I gave this three out of five stars, there were a lot of elements in this that were in the first book which I did really like. Um, especially when it comes to concepts of, like, oracles and prophecy. Prophecies are quite central to Norse mythology, like you have in the Elder Saga, there's, like, the, or the oracle's tale is, like, one of the main texts and stuff like this, so this concept of prophecy, but then, like, how do you interpret prophecy, and 
um, you know, maybe the prophecy means that someone has to do this, but it all hinges upon who does it and that sort of thing. So I really enjoyed the aspect of prophecy in this and how it was interpreted. There's sort of like the return of an old foe. Um, I think my main stumbling block with this one as compared to the other one is um, the first book follows Maddie and Loki are our sort of main points of view. It does change point of view quite a lot, but they're our sort of main focal points. This brings in a third character called Maggie. Um, and first of all, we have Maddie, we have Maggie, and we also have a Mandy, and that got a little confusing after a while. But um, I felt like Maggie had a lot of promise to her as a character. I didn't really like where her character's plotline went. Um, mainly because just a narrative that I don't like is when a character spends most of the text being manipulated, but you're... like, you know it. <laughs> I find it very hard to get enjoyment out of reading a plotline where, like, I know they're being manipulated. They kind of... she kind of, at various points, realises she's being manipulated, but she doesn't really do anything about it. She just kind of is like, maybe I could. And then she's like, or maybe I won't. <laughs> And that's the frustration that I have because that's just like a narrative plotline which I don't love. It has to be done like really well for me to just not get frustrated with it. Um, and then an aspect of that is that there's just like a, there's a whole insta-love thing to Maggie's plotline, which again is kind of acknowledged, but nothing, but doesn't really stop it from happening. You know, I just, there were moments where I felt like, like the character is like, observing and is like oh maybe but then nothing really came of it and so I just find that personally just a bit frustrating because I'm like you're acting in this way and you kind of know you're being manipulated because of this insta love aspect and yet you're kind of doing nothing to stop it <laughs> so I did still enjoy parts of this and I do enjoy the the Norse mythology element and um, there were moments that I did have a fun time, it's just I gave this 3 out of 4 stars because those sorts of aspects really did kind of take away my enjoyment from it. And I think as well that because I wasn't enjoying those parts of the plot, this felt longer to me. Whereas I think it's pretty much the same size as the first book, and I raced through the first book. Like, it was a chunky, it was like a 500 and something page book, but I like raced through it because I was really gripped. Whereas with this one, because there were those aspects of the plot which annoyed me, it dragged a bit more for me. I do have the, um, I've already read the Gospel of Loki because it's kind of a standalone separate thing. I do have the Testament of Loki to read as well, so I will be giving that one a read, and I'm interested to see how that ties into everything, and whether that's picking up on any of these, um, the way that this was, was left with some openness at the end, that sort of thing. So I will be interested to see that. In, and I did still have a fun time, and I have been enjoying reading Joanne M. Harris as an author across all of her many different genres. It's just, I definitely didn't like this one as much as the first one. Finally, I'm just going to end on a non-fiction book. This is The Welsh Language, A History by Janet Davis. This is very much what it says on the tin. It's a history of the Welsh language. So in many ways, it's kind of a potted history of Wales, but it's very specifically looking at um, the development of the language. So it starts off looking at like the linguistic roots of Welsh, like the um, linguistic family it's part of, um, and then it sort of like just takes you through chronologically and looks at um, different historical moments and the effect that they had on the Welsh language, um, because there was a time when Welsh as a language was very much like in danger of falling out of use and become like a bit of a language death situation but there was like a lot of effort put in by activists and stuff like that to kind of uh, reclaim it because a lot of people pushed you know it has very much been made much more a part of Welsh life than at one point it was so um I am attempting to learn Welsh I have said this quite a while. I was doing quite well on my Welsh learning before the pandemic hit because I had like a routine and like on my break at work I used to go on this little walk and I would do my Welsh and I had a nice little routine. Working from home all the time has kind of thrown my routine out the window and I'm terrible so I'm attempting to get back on my Welsh learning because uh, my partner has Welsh family and he speaks Welsh so um, it would be nice for him to be able to have conversations in, <laughs> in that language with someone and I'm trying to be that person. Um, I thought that if I read this and some other Welsh books that I have on my pile, it will just sort of like get me back into thinking about the language and trying to incorporate it and learn it more. And this was really interesting. I really enjoyed there's some tables in this that show like the different um, 
influences like when certain words came into use and like are they drawn upon latin are they drawn upon other things you know stuff like that and i really enjoyed that and just getting a bit of a better understanding of um the the journey that welsh as a language has gone on for example like during the rise of protestantism um the one of the key concepts of that is that like have a bible in english so that every man can read the bible but like that only works for like the english speakers um what about the welsh speakers so like it took a while for there to be a welsh language bible um and that was like a whole process that had to go down and equally like um during times of um like population migration to do with like um industrial revolution and like uh working places like a lot of people moved around in wales that were all welsh but maybe like places that used to be hubs of uh welsh language speakers dispersed somewhat because people left to go other places for work and stuff like this so like th this like migratory movement within wales and stuff like that i don't know it was just it gave me a lot of context, it gave me a lot of interesting history, and I thought it was a very well put together book and quite accessible and easy to read. Like, it was a very, very quick read. It's written in a way that I found to be quite, like, just easy to understand and that sort of thing. Those are the three books I wanted to talk about this week. I would love to hear your thoughts on them. I would love to hear if you have read any of them, all of that and more. Do feel free to leave a comment down below. It's always lovely to hear from people. Um, otherwise, I hope you're having a really lovely day, and I will see you next time for something different.